Hello.
want to thank everybody for hopping on early. We'll get started in about three or four minutes here. But uh, again, just wanted to thank you for hopping on early. And when you are on, please make sure your microphone is on mute unless you're asking a question. And we're looking forward to a great conversation. So we'll get started shortly. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this um, quarterly conversation we have with Britt talking about the Wolves. We're coming down to the home stretch, and uh, the team has been doing what the team has been doing pretty much all year. So um, we've got our resident expert, Britt Robinson, here to tell you all about uh, his thoughts and take on the Wolves as we go into the final few games with the home closer being April 9th, I believe. Uh, I hope that's right, because I actually have tickets to that game. So, um, Britt, thanks again for doing this. And uh, tell us what your take is on this team that is basically that just dropped two in a row. Well, it's uh, more of the same, as you said, um, in 10 game increments, uh, the Wolves have been five and five, 10 and 10, 15 and 15, 19 and 21. They switched it up a little bit at the 40 game mark, 25 and 25, uh, then 31 and 29, switched it up again, but now they are 34 and 34. Uh, so they have been a 500 team fairly consistently. They have been having some hot spots. They were, uh, I think, 11 and six in January. Um, and they've had obviously some corresponding places where they've fallen down. Um, they play a team tonight that is very, very similar. Same record as the Wolves, 34 and 34. The Hawks have been within one game of 522 straight games. So uh, it's going to be an interesting, <laughs> interesting matchup in that respect. And one of the many reasons, I mean, Quinn Snyder now coaches the Hawks. He was Rudy Gobert's coach for 
uh, the last eight no, of I Gobert's think. nine seasons oh, in Utah. So he knows them very well. And again, please, when you're joining, if you can, mute yourself. Thank you so much. Again, when you're joining, if you can, mute yourself. We appreciate that. So whoever's got their uh, microphone on, you yeah. want to turn it off because uh, somebody is moving around in there. Uh, so um, I guess should we do it the way we usually do it, Harry? Yeah, let's let's do it the way we usually do it. Um, with that being said, I do want to make uh, a again a thank you to all of our viewers and readers, and um, I'm going to be putting something in the chat that will. Uh, bring you to our support page. As you know, MenPost is an independent nonprofit news organization, and we thrive off of members and subscribers, just like the people who are here on this Zoom, and we appreciate your continued support and would ask for that support in the future. So I'll be putting something in the chat just shortly. With that being said, Britt, Britt you can uh, take it from here. Okay, great. Um the way it usually works here is if you have a question, do the uh, raised hand thing in the, I think it's the reactions, and I'll call on people as I see them cross the uh, cross the threshold there. The uh, I can show you what it looks like. It's a raised hand like that, and it's down there in the reactions. So if you can show that, I will know you want to ask a question, and we can get this thing rolling. And if uh, no one has a question, I can uh, just talk about a variety of things that are on my mind uh, while we wait. Uh, here we go. Okay, let's start with Paula. Um, do you think there's something, I saw Dan Moore had a lot of uh, ways he said the cat situation might go. Maybe they're just being cautious. Maybe there's something sinister, s deeper going on. What are your thoughts? My thoughts is I don't get into uh, subterfuge um most of the time there's a million reasons behind the scenes that things happen um i've had a chance to peek behind the scenes a couple of times just via friends of friends or somebody from inside a team telling me something and uh, agendas are rife and there's a, a lot of things that are usually going on but most of the time um you know kevin loves knuckle push-ups situation i mean there's a there's a lot of things that are mysteries i prefer to just wait until cat is on the floor and then we find out what happens from there um my feeling on it is that cat suffered a significant calf strain i think that part is real he went down like he was shot from a gun and there wasn't anybody near him at the time which is consistent with a achilles injury as a matter of fact which is what i thought it was when it happened but it turns out it was a severe calf strain. And uh, Kevin Durant had a severe calf strain last season and had a heck of a time getting back. Um, more on our team, uh, the, the Wolves, uh, Jordan McLaughlin had a calf strain, tried to come back a little too soon, uh, was back on the shelf after two or three games and uh, was very rusty in four or five games before he found his stride. So it's a significant injury. It did not look like it wasn't a significant injury when it happened. So the four to six weeks that were originally forecast, none of those sources were Timberwolf sources. Uh, there were people who uh, are basically click people who um, pretend to have inside information. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But in this particular case, they were obviously wrong. So uh, my take on it in general is, when cat comes back what happens then i've got a lot of feelings about that that we can get into that i've talked with dane about on his podcast obviously but uh before that happens i'll take a question from let me see from tony tony bronson thanks Britt. hey i first want to thank you for having this uh format i think this is great to give us access to somebody that's really knowledgeable about the timberwolves also want to say Really appreciate having you in the Timberwolves community. I think we're very fortunate to have a seasoned veteran who's not uh, uh, afraid to ask the tough questions, whether it's in the post-game interviews or, or uh, even the in-game tweeting that you do, which I, I really appreciate, which is true analysis. So thanks for being the person and the writer that you are. 
Um, the question I have, Britt, is I saw that tonight, Rudy, is a game time decision, and it seems like that's happening a little, uh, a little bit recently. They call it groin injury, and it, I don't know if you think that's a, truly a recurring injury, or do you think that's just a way to give him some periodic rest? I think he's probably been dinged up. I think this is now the time where um, you really can't afford to rest him. As I said, on the road against an Eastern Conference team, a 500 team, winnable game, but not a gimme. Um, the Wolves have had a habit this year of not having any gimmies anyway. They've beaten a lot of good teams and lost a lot of bad teams. But I think, you know, originally it was diagnosed as an ankle is the reason why he might not be on. You, said, you know, if a groin is what was the most recent news. Again, it's one of those situations where you can speculate and drive yourself crazy over, you know, what kind of shape this person is or isn't. I think it is a little bit concerning that Gobert has played a ton of minutes. He's been deep into the playoffs a few times. He's been in the playoffs pretty much every season, six or seven or eight in a row. Um, he's 30 years old, uh, not that old, but uh, somebody who's banging all the time in the paint. Um, you know, it can happen. So uh, if he doesn't go tonight, um, I've just got to point out that the Wolves are eight and four without him. So uh, it's not all is not lost. Thank you. Jay. Britt, I echo everything that Tony said about your coverage through the years with the team. I truly appreciate it. Um, to stick on the the last two topics or the last two questions, I guess, with Cat and Rudy. So um, when, hopefully not if, Cat comes back this year, um, you know, one of the main things you everybody's looking for is how he and Rudy coexist. So if we if we take that outside of the equation, because looking at it, when we came to the year, I think, you know, like, how are they going to coexist? We hope they'd have that figured out by maybe January 1st. I'm looking at it like it's obviously going to take a whole year and probably would have taken longer, even if Cat would have been healthy. But out, outside of those two playing together, if you look at this year, not having the improvements we had hoped for as the team, going in the rest of the year, hopefully on, in the playoffs, however long that is, and into the offseason, what other things are you looking for out of this team and how they coexist for the remainder of the year going into the offseason? I'm looking to see if they can solve the thing that was my greatest concern between those two guys uh, at the beginning of the season and wasn't adequately uh, answered uh, during the time that Cat was healthy, which is how do you play Gobert at the five and Cat at the four against most teams in what is usually regarded as a fly around four, five out situation where Cat almost necessarily has to be one of the chasing people. You can try to disguise it a little bit with switches. You can disguise it a little bit with zones. Um, but at the end of the day, you've got a, a guy even slimmed down to 240 pounds. He's got size 20 shoes. He's never been known as somebody who's fleet of foot anyway. And it is a difficult proposition for me to see how the defense works to its optimal capabilities with Cat and Rudy on the floor. They get burned in transition, at least they did get burned in transition when Cat was healthy. Um, I do think they've figured some things out with Cat out on defense, obviously there. Uh, and, and for that matter, you know, the, the defensive rating between Cat and Gobert was not terrible, but you're going to get a top 10 to top 12 defense with Gobert on the floor, regardless of who is playing next to him. That's kind of been his template from the beginning. Um, but can you maximize Gobert and Cat at both ends of the floor? That does not seem to have been the case. I do think that Cat does hurt this defense when he plays with Gobert. Um, it is something I'm going to be looking for probably more than any other thing when he comes back. I have enjoyed sometimes the places where they put Gobert in the high roll situation where he's out meeting somebody at the pick and roll and he's not in drop coverage. I don't think that's something you want to do against every team. And I don't think you necessarily want to do it just because cat is usually more comfortable playing that again at the five position. Um, but I am curious to see how they solve that particular problem of making cat and Rudy be not only 
a barely uh, adequate duo on defense, but something that uh, reflects the fact that you have a, a guy like Rudy Gobert on the floor. iPhone. That's all I see on the raised hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's kind of a long question, but I know Dane talks about the comparisons between defensively between the Celtics and the Wolves in regards to the per perimeter defense and the front court similarities. And I was rewatching the Celtics Warriors finals and noticed that they were running drop with Robert Williams and also Al, whenever Al was also in with Robert Williams, when Al was guarding the screener. Uh, do you think that the Wolves could utilize this a little bit when Cat comes back, drop with Rudy, and then hedging with Carl on screens, especially since they've been pre-switching recently? I think it is something they'll definitely look at. I also think that um, you have six, seven seasons of Cat playing drop that have not gone well. It's a very large sample size. Now, granted, he hasn't had uh, core personnel that are necessarily all the same, but we saw a, a, a real uptick in Cat's defensive effectiveness, again, only as a center, but uh, you saw a real uptick in, in when they ran high wall. Uh, he was more active. He wasn't uh, somebody who always had to drop back and make quick decisions on multiple people, perhaps coming to the rim. He was able to get out there. He had a hustler like Vando and some other people, Jade McDaniels, people who could be the low man who slides over and protects the rim if the big is out. Um, so I think it's fairly well understood and perhaps was the key to last season's success that the Wolves found a defense that was a very effective defense for them. That is not a defense that Gobert runs well, but the one that Gobert does run well is the defense that Cat has not run well. To your point, um, I think they somewhat have to try Cat and drop uh, with the personnel on the roster that has been playing drop quite a bit with Gobert and see if they can make those things work. Um, but Al Horford is a long way from Carl Anthony Towns when it comes to drop defense. And for that matter, uh, Time Lord, Robert Williams, in many respects, is a different kettle of fish than Rudy Gobert in terms of how he drops. Uh, he's a lot more active than Gobert. Um, but it, it's not uh, a ridiculous idea. It just comes back to that thing that I was talking about before. How do you maximize these guys? And I think that they are kind of open to whatever works. Well, do you think it's possible that they do both at the same time? Whenever Cat is, uh, is guarding the screener on the main ball handler, like the primary guy, that he hedges? and has like Rudy as the low man and they switch around that. And then in that same sense, whenever Rudy is the, uh, guarding the screen and they do drop, is there a way that you can do both at the same time? I would be more confident of that if they had been running anything remotely like it uh, for any period of time. Uh, I think that Cat really was confused about the four responsibilities versus the five responsibilities when he was on the court. He was actually playing semi-drop sometimes anyway, alongside Gobert, forgetting that he had to be out chasing. Um, staying with the screener and Gobert is the low man. Uh, it might work. The problem is it's a, you know, defense is a five-person game and everybody's on a string. And theoretically, it might work. Uh, Again, you're talking about the playoffs when, you know, it's heightened intensity or, may, you know, maybe you're talking about the last five or 10 games of the season. But in any case, uh, the amount of reps that would take for a veteran like Cat and a veteran like Rudy to play with somebody who's very different than the other big near the paint that they have played with all the time uh, in a pressurized environment of needing to win games to make the playoffs or being in the playoffs all represents a situation that to me is dicey. But I, again, I don't want to dismiss what you're saying. I don't think it's out of bounds or ridiculous because I don't think anything is necessarily a proven solution at this point. I just think they do have to whittle down what they do want to try and then stay with uh, to one or two options and then see what happens. I uh, don't see anybody else's hands up. 
Are we, uh, Jay, your hand number. is still up. Yeah. Is that for another yeah. question? Yeah, I popped another one just based on that on that question, kind of two part. Um, is there a world where Rudy can be successful? So two part question. Is there a world that where Rudy can be successful on the high wall uh, first? Um, I, I know it's not his strength, but just fantasize about a world where that might be a possibility. And then the second would be, if it is or if it isn't, where do you see, if I'm glass half full and I see this team getting out of the play in, into the actual playoffs, um, based on some of the matchup, either advantages or challenges they have, who do you see from a matchup perspective them being the most favorable matchup um, looking into the playoffs? Um, the answer to your first question is easier. Uh, yes, I think that in limited situations, Rudy already has been somewhat effective in the high wall. I thought the, the last game against Dallas, uh, he played high wall a lot, which is what you almost have to do with Luca on the floor. Uh, somebody who can create like that um, and basically decide how he wants to beat you. You want to pressure the ball on that situation a little bit more. Uh, Luca kills drop coverage. Um, but can a steady diet of it uh, be something? Uh, is that Rudy Gobert's natural? Are you taking advantage of what he does best? Uh, the answer to those are no, but there are definitely situations against certain opponents where the Wolves have to run a high wall, and Rudy has proven to be decent at that. Um, the problem with that, you say, well, okay, great. Cat does the high wall too. Let's go. Cat runs the high wall well from the five, uh, and it's not a huge distinction, but it is somewhat of a distinction that um, he would be playing the power forward position instead of the center position if they're in a high wall concept. Um, as to the best opponent, um, I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, the Wolves have uh, won two out of three from Sacramento. They've split with the Nuggets. Uh, I think they've split with the Grizzlies. Um, they are one and two against uh, Golden State, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I, I think Golden State is a bad matchup for them just because uh, Golden State has just the pedigree. You don't want to meet Golden State in the postseason at any point. They, believe me, right now, they think they're going to win another ring. They're not the least bit unconfident despite their record because they've done it for so long. Mm -hmm. um, I think. The easy answer would be Sacramento just because they're untested and they're, you know, going into the playoffs. The Wolves have beaten them twice. They've been a really entertaining, high-scoring games, the kind of games that the Wolves kind of like to play. Um, but Sacramento is a very good team, and it would be dicey. It, it would be a 2-7 matchup probably or maybe a 3-6 matchup if Memphis gets back above Sacramento. But um, those would be, I would say, Sacramento maybe. Phoenix, I would not want to play just because, again, that pedigree of Durant, if he's able to come back, Chris Paul and Booker. Uh, Chris Paul and Booker have done very well against the Wolves. Um, I would actually think a Denver series, you know, is an unlikely 1-8 series where the Wolves kind of have nothing to lose. They're the eight seed. They're playing in the top seed. But they have played Jokic kind of tough. Jokic-led teams kind of tough. And uh, they have split the series this year, 2-2. Two and two. But on the other hand, the one game they won most recently, Denver left all their players home and then just kicked their ass when all their players were back uh, a, a day or two later when they, they went to Denver. So uh, I guess the answer to the second question is, I'd look forward to Denver or Memphis or Sacramento. Quite frankly, I would not like Golden State. Thank you. Mark Snyder. Hi, Brett. Uh, hey, Mark. I'm going to ask a question that you may want to have to pause and think for a second, but um, I'm trying to think about beyond these last few games and potential playoffs and look to the future a little bit more. And I'm wondering for the, the extent that you've been able to view some of those younger players that that are more towards the back of the bench, who do you see maybe taking on a role in the future? Well, I love Josh Minot. Um, 
I think that he's incredibly raw, um, but he's raw in a really good way. I would not want to curb too much of that rawness because he has the athleticism to cover for a lot of his youthful mistakes. He has a love of the game. I mean, I don't want to put too much pressure on him, and this isn't meant anywhere near a direct comparison, but he kind of reminds me of Ant early in Ant's career in his rookie season where uh, he had a feel for the game and was running around, um, extremely athletic, extremely active, seemed to be just having a good time while he was out on the court. And, uh, you know, I, I think that Minot is somebody who hustles because he's liking what he's doing. He's not hustling because somebody has told him it's a skill that he has to have. He's not hustling because he feels like he won't get minutes if he doesn't hustle. He's just somebody who is not really going to malinger on the court. Uh, at least he hasn't thus far. Um, because he's playing basketball and he likes to play basketball. Um, he makes mistakes. He strays too much on defense sometimes. He commits too hard on defense sometimes. Uh, his shot is uh, an adventure. But I just, I love his raw ability. Um, the other guy that the Wolves drafted this year, aside from Walker Kessler, who's obviously going to be a very good pro, um, is Wendell Moore Jr., who I think has a higher floor and a much lower ceiling than Josh Minot. And I see him as somebody whose upside is ninth, tenth person on the bench. Uh, somebody who, who gets minutes if somebody is hurt in a rotation. Um, maybe I'm selling him short. We'll see. I do think that unlike Josh Minot, he knows what he's doing on the court. He knows what his assignments are. He executes those assignments. Uh, he just, his skill level um, is just, he doesn't have the natural talent that most NBA pros do. And he compensates for it by being kind of, you know, mediocre at least at almost everything. He's got a decent handle, good court vision, not a bad shooter sometimes. Um, but he's just somebody who is, you know, he's like a utility infielder in baseball or uh, a special teams guy in football. A guy who uh, doesn't necessarily hurt you if he has a very minor role on your team. But the more you play him, the more it is a sign that your team is not firing on all cylinders. Uh, as for the other people that are young, you know, I mean, Nas Reed is still 23 years old and is uh, making great strides every year. I believe he'll probably be priced out of this market. Uh, I think he'll probably want more than the Wolves want to give him. The question is whether another team will want to pay it. I think he's shown enough really cool flashes this year that a team will pay a decent amount of money for him. Um, the Wolves really can't afford with Gobert and Cat making a combined $90 million next year. I don't think that you want to throw another eight to $10 million on the fire for another front court person. Um, so I think they'll let him go. As for the other young players on the team, Ant's 21 and Jade McDaniels is 22. And they're arguably uh, the two best players, certainly been the two most consistent players on the Timberwolves this season. Tony, another question. Thanks, Brett. Don't forget the mute. There you go. I remember two questions, uh, separate questions. The first one is the Wolves have managed to lose games to some of the worst teams in the league this year based on record. And just curious to get your take on what's the driver behind that? Why do we not seem to be able to get up for the games against the lesser teams? That's question one. Question two is the D'Lo trade. So D'Lo, I think last night had 31 points through three quarters. We certainly are right now missing his shooting. Of course, he's streaky, but we, we, we certainly could use his shooting with Cats still out. How do you feel now that we've had a number of games with Mike Conley? How do you feel about that trade out between, the, you know, forget about the draft picks and the rest of it and the D'Lo becoming a free agent and all. It's just the trade for uh, the trade out, uh, Mike Conley for D'Lo. How are you feeling about that at this stage? Okay, I'll answer them in order. I think that um, 
the Wolves have had a character problem all season. And I think this is indicative of that. Uh, they are not a likable team in that respect. Uh, I don't think that they take care of business. Uh, they let bad opponents and large leads, uh, they take them for granted. They think that if they have a large lead, that they will win the game. They think if they have a poor opponent, that they will win the game. And um, they are not in a position to think that way. They have not earned anything. Um, they made the playoffs last year. Um, three of the top seven guys in minutes on that team are gone now. Uh, and so they have a lot to prove. And, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I can point to things that are uh, reasons on the box score as to what happens. They go through bouts where they commit a lot of silly turnovers and those turnovers uh, put them in a chaotic situation where they are running back and forth a lot. They have not been good at transition all year. They don't look good matching up with people on the fly. Uh, sometimes they are thinking that uh, they're playing regular get back on defense rather than realizing it's a transition opportunity. You have to prioritize who you're taking to stop the points rather than match up with a man. Matchups become an emergency rather than a facility. Um, and then also, I think they have trouble rebounding. Uh, it's something that Gobert trade was supposed to address. It has not. And a plethora of offensive rebounds by the opposing team is disheartening. Uh, you play good defense for a while, you get a missed shot, an offensive rebound, all of a sudden those two points happen anyway. Or maybe it's even a third chance or a fourth chance. And I see that those offensive rebounds by the opponents and turnovers by the Wolves sometimes get clustered and they lose runs. I think that's been pretty indicative of some of the worst games they played this year. Uh, and those all go to uh, a lack of maturity. Um, and this is an older team now. Um, I, I think that they have gotten a little bit better at that, quite frankly. They don't, they haven't, you know, been terrible with losing to terrible opponents. At least some of it has to do with the fact that they haven't played a lot of terrible opponents recently. Most of them are gone by now. But I do think uh, that lack of character is an issue and it comes from not adequately taking care of the ball and not adequately doing things like boxing out and being uh, aggressive in terms of following through on your assignments. Um, the other question about D'Lo, first of all, I do wanna slightly correct the record because I, and I've done this myself, uh, the D'Lo trade was not for Conley straight up. The Wolves got Nikhil Alexander-Walker and two second round draft picks or three second round draft picks in addition. Uh, that's not nothing. Uh, NAW, as everybody's come to start calling him, the NAW, his initials, um, just killed the Wolves in their last game because he couldn't hit three pointers, but has been a reliable three point shooter, both with Utah this season and certainly during his time with the Wolves. He's aggressive. He's kind of a Swiss Army knife kind of guy. He's got he's six six, which means he's two inches taller than Austin Rivers and Jalen Noel, the two players whose minutes I think he's taking. Uh, even though uh, Rivers and Noel theoretically have been hurt and have been hurt to some extent, um, he is got a kind of a uh, he's not. I would not call him a point guard, but I would call him a combo guard. Uh, and I think it's a decent piece. As for if you're thinking of Conley for D'Lo straight up, uh, you knew going in you were making trade-offs. Um, you were not getting the shooting that you got out of D'Lo from Conley, Naw, or your second round picks. Um, you were assuming Cat perhaps was going to be back earlier than he was and that you were thinking a low usage point guard like Mike Conley might be somebody who would fit better in terms of getting shots for people who had to be fed, uh, specifically Ant and Cat, but to still, to some extent, uh, Rudy Gobert and even Jaden McDaniels has proven that he should be more than just a catch and shoot fifth option from the corner. So in that respect, Conley was supposed to help that. 
Conley was also supposed to help exactly what I just got through talking about, improving the character of this team, calming them down in situations, reducing the turnovers, um, stressing the things that they need to do to do well. And Conley was brought in to make Rudy Gobert better, more comfortable, uh, get Rudy the ball in situations he likes having the ball, and just improve the overall team IQ. Um, thus far, I would say that the Conley trade has been successful in terms of what it was supposed to do. I think that uh, Mike Conley has been as advertised. Uh, He's a quality individual. The Wolves are a more reliable team when he is on the court. Um, and if Cat were back and shooting well from three-point range, it might be better in that respect as well. Um, what Mike Connolly can't do and what remains an issue is that you have had all season long, and it's, it's one of the things that uh, I've always been harping on is this fly around mentality versus fundamental basketball. And it would be ideal to blend those two attributes. And whenever they do blend those two attributes, I write a semi ecstatic column about it because I really want to see it. And I don't think it's impossible, uh, but I think it's difficult. I think Rudy Gobert and Anthony Edwards are not a natural pairing. Um, I think that it's conceivable that they can work out really well, uh, but it's going to take some time. And it also, a cat and Gobert trio is going to take maybe not exponentially more time. But again, it's that trade was not as smooth a roster fit as Tim Conley and Chris Finch thought it would be. And that's why this has been a disappointing season. Um, I give you some stats. I mean, Anthony Edwards right now, since the All-Star break, um, is, uh, let me see, oh, here it is. Uh, and since the All-Star break, they score 108.3 points per 100 possessions in the 265 minutes Ann is on the court since the All-Star break. Uh, with Ann off the court, um, they score 113 points. So they score almost five points per 100 possessions uh, with Ant off the court than with Ant on the court since the All-Star break. Uh, on defense, um, with Ant on the court, they allow 111.9, off the court 114.1. So he has improved on defense. But the bottom line remains, the net rating for Ant since the All-Star break in 265 minutes is minus 3.6. Uh, the net rating for Ant in the 76 minutes he is off the court, the Wolves are minus 1-1. One, one. Um, again, I think some of that has to do with the fact that Ant was fatigued after the All-Star break. Uh, I also think that the addition of Conley and slow-mo Kyle Anderson and Gobert is a sensibility. That's a three-person sensibility of very careful, deliberate vets who have played a certain way at a certain time and the best offensive rating for the Wolves out of the All-Star break in terms of when they're on the court. When Slomo's on the court, they're 112-2, Conley 111-8, Gobert 109-7. Those are the three highest offensive ratings. Um, it is that style is what is quote unquote working because that is the style that's being imposed since they arrived. Um, is that the best style for the Wolves to play? I don't know. I mean, you know, they're, they're 110 per 100 possessions right now overall. The one guy who seems to be able to play both ways is Jade McDaniels. Um, J-Mac, John McLaughlin, uh, who is a plus-minus guru, always has been, except for... Uh, the time when he came back from that calf injury and was rusty and was ineffective for a while. But since the All-Star break, he is a plus four. Uh, the Wolves only give up 105.7 points per 100 possessions while he's in the game. It's only been 107 minutes, but they've only played overall 341, so about a third of the time. 
Um, but the point being that the only other person who's a plus in net rating for the Wolves, who have a three and four record since the All-Star break in those seven games, is Jaden McDaniels, who's 109.6 versus 109.4 plus 0 0.2 in a sizable 226 minutes. Jaden McDaniels is the one guy who can play right now either way. He can play that deliberate Conley, Gobert, slow-mo style, or he can play up-tempo. Uh, and part of that is, is that he's a defensive specialist who works off of whatever the offense delivers to him on the side, but that defense is gold regardless of <laughs> what system they're playing. Uh, Ale Hoag. Yeah, hybrid. Um, you've mentioned that you've covered the Wolves since 1989, and I'll, I'll, I'll say if you're ever inspired to write a book, I will 100% buy it. Um, but being later in this chat, I figured it might be a decent time to ask a question just about franchise history that I've been kind of curious about. So feel free to pivot. And, you know, if your response is just a grab bag of any kind of favorite anecdotes, go ahead. But as a prompt, um, I'd love to hear about your experience covering the Marbury trade and what that young Marbury KG team was like in its kind of pre-trade quickening phase to use, you know, your figure of speech. Well, um, it was extremely exciting because there was uh, no prelude to speak of. I mean, the Pooh Richardson, Tony Campbell, Randy Brewer era was not filled with highlights. Um, Bill Musselman did win way too many games his first season because he was not a rebuilding coach. And in classic Wolves fashion, right off the bat, they got a win now coach to coach their expansion team in the first year. Um, and that led to uh, Musselman's failure to play Gerald Glass uh, was, was his undoing uh, because Gerald Glass was considered to be somebody who, who could be a really good pro. Um, anyway, the point being that when they drafted Garnett and Garnett became the goods fairly recently, uh, you know, this is 95, so this is six years in, but it was the first glimmer you had, you know, your Gugliata uh, already on board. You had KG, and all of a sudden Marbury comes in a year after KG, and uh, that trio was a dynamic core. Um, they were they played the same kind of game. Googs was actually uh, a really good ball handler who could dish uh, really well, rebound really well, uh, had decent range from different places. Um, so there was a lot of excitement. And when they made the playoffs, um, that was very exciting, obviously. The issue was that the KG deal was so exorbitant. And I'll always give Glenn Taylor, people who rip Glenn Taylor, and, and there's a lot to rip, believe me, I, you know, I, I jump in oftentimes. But in this particular instance, uh, Glenn Taylor paid Kevin Garnett enough money to keep him in Minnesota. It was an exorbitant amount of money for the time, 21 million a year for six seasons. And the NBA knew that they had Kobe's contract coming up. Shaq was the other one who had just signed a big deal. Uh, and they, the NBA looked at what a small market team in Minnesota was paying somebody like Kevin Garnett, who was great, but was not yet like a, a top five player in the NBA yet and uh, freaked and basically imposed the salary cap is what happened. And that's one of the triggers for the salary cap happening. The issue with that was by the time Marbury was done with his rookie year, he wanted to get paid as much as KG got paid. And it was impossible. KG was grandfathered in. Uh, $21 million was not something that, you know, you could get uh, out of your rookie deal back then, uh, salary cap terms. So Marbury basically demanded, he was already homesick for New York, demanded a trade. Um, I've heard on from reliable sources, uh, doesn't necessarily mean I definitely think it is true because um, I don't want to put myself in that kind of jeopardy, but I do think that Glenn Taylor offered Marbury some kind of situation where he might work 
for the Taylor companies as a way to get that salary up. Uh, it didn't matter. Marbury eventually left and um, it was a really tough situation because Gugliotta had left because he didn't get along with Marbury at the end. And so the Wolves were left with nobody to hang out with KG. Um, and, you know, they did get Terrell Brandon and uh, it was a very solid. I mean, that was the beginning of their playoff teams, their run of six straight first round exits, but they're also their run of six straight playoff teams. Um, would KG and Marbury have been an elite duo? I think so. Uh, I think that had Marbury been able to be less homesick and less egotistical and just realized that what the Wolves were offering him was the most they could possibly offer him, um, and he had stuck around, I think not only would the Wolves have been a lot better in terms of their arc, of their uh, tenure, legacy, or whatever, but Stefan Marbury would have been a lot better off. Um, he, working with KG, was a, a really special duo and was very synergistic. And so, yeah, I I, I think it, it's, it's one of the footnote tragedies of the Timberwolves, but, um, you know, it was what it was, and the Wolves were able to recover to the extent that they built a team around KG and Terrell Brandon and, you know, some obviously some other pieces that were not quite as strong, but still there. Um, Wally Zerbiak and some others um, and made the playoffs and won 50 games three times in addition, making the playoffs uh, six straight times. So, but would KG have been better off with another elite player next to him? Absolutely. The one season in Minnesota that he had two really good players operating with him on all cylinders. Um, they made the Western Conference Finals and KG was MVP. John Phelan. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I have a two-part question. My first question is, who? what type of player do you think that the Timberwolves should sign with their uh, mid-level exception next year? And then my second question was, I just had a guy in mind. I wanted to hear your response to it. So. Okay. Um, I think a play player type is more, uh, you know, I mean, you never really know what, what how the dominoes will fall or anything. I think the Wolves still need to get an active defensive oriented combo guard. Um, I think that their front court is stuffed right now with, uh, uh, even if you don't have Nas, You've got um, Gobert, Cat, Kyle Anderson, Torian Prince, who's a combo forward, uh, and Josh Minot, who I'm very high on, uh, perhaps in the next year or two or three coming forward. So um, at the point, um, they could draft a point guard. Uh, actually, not this season. They could draft one in the second round, one of their second rounders, or they could pick up a point guard. I think Conley will be around for this coming season. I think he'll age well. Um, I think that he may get signed beyond the year he has left next year. Um, but I think in you know in the long run, uh, they want Ant to be kind of a playmaking guy who can be a guy who can be like Jason Tatum type, a Paul George type, who gets five or six assists a game, or at least averages about four a game. Uh, sometimes eight, sometimes two, whatever. Um, we saw evidence of that when D'Lo was playing more off the ball. And so I, I like that. I like that about Ann. I like Ann as a playmaker. Uh, and I think that if you had a, a gritty, a defensive-oriented combo guard who would get after it, uh, considering that the middle level is pretty much all they have cap-wise, uh, you're going to be spending upwards between eight and $11 million on somebody that's what I'd go for. Who'd you have in mind? Um, I went the opposite way. I was thinking that if Nas leaves that and we decide to toggle Cat on, Rudy off, Rudy on, Rudy, Cat off, that 
you go with a guy like Maxi Kleba. So shooting for Rudy and rebounding help for him. And then also whenever Cat's on and Rudy's off, you can put Kleba in there to maybe like help him run co- drop coverage because you can have Kleba on the drop or Kleba at the four and also uh, rebounding help for him. So I don't know what uh-huh. you thought. Of. I don't think that's ridiculous. Uh, I think there is one of the issues that I've had, even though Nas has had a great season and the eye test has been phenomenal. There are times when he's just been terrible. Uh, could Kleba be better? I think, frankly, that is one of the things that has plagued Maxi Kleber in his career as well, is there are times when he doesn't work out. Uh, he, like Nas, is really dependent on who he's playing with and who he's playing against. Uh, but again, you're talking about an A2, $11 million player, and you're talking about somebody who fits a, 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 a role on the team. Uh, I think if you're talking about that kind of stretch four or five, um, that he is certainly a, a viable option. I would go in another direction simply because I think that you want Tori and Prince around uh, next year and then maybe beyond just because he's a really good locker room guy and seems to play well. And you definitely want Kyle uh, Anderson around because he's a good playmaker. And if you are running Ant as your, you know, your playmaker, it's really nice to have a guy like Kyle Anderson who can put Ant off the ball, especially in crunch time and uh, basically get him in situations where he's off the catch and bounce rather than just bringing the ball up. So I would still lean toward the front court that we have and leave Kleber alone, but I don't think it's a ridiculous uh, um, scenario that you, that you went that way. And then uh, I think you were right about Jalen Williams because he looks kind of good. It'd be nice to have him on the squad. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I I did like Jalen Williams a lot. I don't watch any college basketball, so, you know, it's this weird situation. For those who know, Jalen Williams is a, uh, I guess, kind of a wing. He's a jack of all trades who can play pretty much anything but center. But the Thunder use him in, in a lot of really good roles. And the Thunder have drafted very well. I really love that Thunder team. I mean, they don't have Chet this year, and they're a game behind the Wolves in the standings. And they've got a ton of draft picks. Uh, they're just they're well run and and they're fun to watch. But yeah, Jalen Williams from Santa Clara of all places. But he was gone by the time the Wolves were going to pick anyway. So, you know, there it goes. Tony, another question. Brett, one comment and two questions. The right. First, the comment is I think the Silicon Valley Bank CEO that's on this call is really Dane Moore. <laughs> The two questions are, one is you mentioned rebounding challenges earlier. Um, and I've, my take just observing is that I think Punk, one of the challenges with the rebounding is, is the players think we've got Rudy under the basket, so I'm going to clear out and head back. And I think that seems to happen more often than not. And obviously Rudy can't get every rebound. So the first question is, would you agree with that take? Second question is, that's a heck of a CD collection behind you, and I'm curious, what's your favorite CD on that shelf? Oh, well, uh, I'll, I'll take, uh, I, I have, I, I review music as well as write about basketball. So uh, um, back in the days when uh, music was sent via CD rather than via streams, uh, I had Christmas every day, and have received literally thousands of CDs over the course of my life. And uh, what you see here is, I think, probably the upstairs part of the alphabet between H and S. Uh, so there's a lot of CDs there and H and S. I'm sure there's something by Mingus in there. If it's M and it's upstairs, I think most of my Mingus is downstairs. But I'm sure there's a Mingus record back there. It's probably my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um as for the rebounding, um, Chris Finch believes in crashing the boards instead of getting back in transition uh, as a way. He's had to abandon that this year because the Wolves remain a team that um, 
doesn't do well in transition. Uh, it is a failing, and it's one of the ways that Chris Finch has kind of had to compromise the things he likes to do the most. Uh, I would agree that I, I actually think that, you know, we talked about D'Lo before, and there's a lot of reasons to like D'Lo. D'Lo is awful at boxing out. D'Lo is awful at staying with his man uh, on defense in general. Uh, but D'Lo also thought that once the shot went up, he did not have to worry about his man anymore. Uh, and to some extent, he should have been there for the outlet, but he also should have made sure that what the nature of the rebounding situation was in front of him, whether or not it was going to be the type of rebound that was not going to be an automatic rebound, and you have to check your man. D'Lo doesn't box out. Ant is frequently somebody who doesn't box out. Um, Jane McDaniels does it better than those two do, but I would not say that that's one of his strengths. Um, Kyle Anderson does box out. Um, I would say that it is a fundamentals thing um, to the extent that Chris Finch should be blamed for things. Um, and I think most people read me know I'm a big Chris Finch guy. I, I don't think he's had as good a season this year as he had last season. It would be very difficult to have as good a season. He was fantastic for this team last year. But um, I, I think that they need to be more fundamental in their approach. And they need their guards. Conley, I have to be quite frankly, I don't know. I haven't watched Conley on box outs enough to know how good or bad or assiduous he is at that. Uh, but I just know that it's basketball one-on-one. -on -one. Make sure your other guy, your guy you're guarding, doesn't extend the possession on you. Uh, and if for some reason he goes to the glass, you know, and you're not boxing out, hope for the rebound and get on your horse and, you know, maybe burn him in transition. But it's just, it's part of that low character I was talking about. Thank you. Good responses. I'll take uh, one more if anybody has it. And then it's uh, 625 is what I've got. I, I can do like another five minutes, but I'm going to give you my own little min post pitch at about 628. So let's do about four more, or three more minutes. And if anybody's got any questions, uh, if not, I'll just kind of get into a little bit about, you know, what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes when, you know, the Wolves play the Hawks. Silicon Valley. Hey, Britt. I uh, just saw Nas Reed is out for tonight. Who would you like to see those uh, minutes go to? Is Gobert in? Yes. Okay, so uh, the pregame report was that Gobert might be questionable because what I heard was an ankle, and then it turned out to be a, maybe a groin. Uh, and Nas out. Who would I want Nas's minutes to go to? I think the fact that Atlanta plays Capella and Okongwu at the center position, neither one are big, they're both quick, means that uh, you want to go probably with Knight over Garza, uh, unless you can figure out uh, a mismatch that turns that into something in Garza's favor. I think the Hawks might run Garza off the floor, quite frankly, if he is the one taking Nas's minutes. I don't think either one of them will get the minutes that Nas would be getting, because I do think you want to run uh, more Prince and slow-mo and lineups that feature um, that kind of quickness. I think that the things I'm interested in tonight are, I'm interested in Ant shaking his slump. Uh, teams have begun to switch a lot in terms of guarding him. They come with a double sometimes, but more often they're coming with creative switching so that he's not necessarily seeing two players, but he's seeing a different player uh, as he pivots or as he moves into the next phase, especially if he's going around to go bare screen, which has been bread and butter this year. Um, the Hawks have some really fine uh, wing defenders. Uh, one of the reasons I got Murray from San Antonio is he's an excellent defender. Uh, DeAndre Hunter is a very, very good player, very similar profiles in very many ways, like Jade McDaniels. 
uh, somebody who's long and lean and can guard one through four. Um, and then Capella is a, a quick, you know, he, he can be bullied, but he, he's a he's a quick player. John Collins is a quick player. Uh, so I'm interested to see how Ann handles what gets thrown at him defensively. Finch openly talked about him being disappointed in his assist numbers for a second straight game. Some of that, of course, you can't have assists if your team isn't knocking down your passes off the shots. But I do think that Ann has been a little bit too ball hoggy and has been a little bit too focused on backing up the, his, you go to an all-star game at the age of 21 and you're picked first among all the subs by LeBron James, and you make all kinds of news by saying, I'm playing load management stinks. And, you know, you're a big man and you should be, I mean, he's a phenomenal player, but he still has to play within a team concept. He still has to deal with the fact that the Wolves have three guys on the floor in Conley, Gobert, and Slomo, who are playing in a kind of more fundamental team oriented fashion. Um, and then I think that Ant needs to practice better shot selection and better court vision tonight. Uh, in terms of the Gobert Capella matchup, uh, both are at a disadvantage, I think, when uh, they're on defense i think capella can be somebody who's too quick and uh trey young can run the pick and roll with capella and collins uh, i think quick and pick and rolls it'll be interesting to see gobert guard that i do think that with conley and slow-mo the way we've seen gobert on offense uh he punished brooklyn it was his best offensive game in a timberwolves uniform there's a capability for him to do that again uh tonight um the Wolves bench really has to come up big. Uh, the Hawks have had a tremendous bench lately ever since they got Sadiq Bay, who's kind of been the Kevin Herter that they missed. Herter got traded to uh, the Kings, or maybe it was a free agent deal. I can't remember now. But uh, they needed a, a floor spacer again to go along with uh, Hunter and Trey Young and Bogdanovich, who they, they play that kind of loosey-goosey, you know, wheel around play and uh, Sadiq Bay fits right into that. And then Okongu is a, you know, I loved Okongu coming out of the draft and uh, he's been a plus, he's been a, like a J-Mac, he's been a net ratings king. And uh, they have a very good bench is the bottom line here is Sadiq Bay and, uh, and uh, the other two people I just mentioned are people who are, going to give the Wolves fits. And then there's the Quinn Snyder angle. He's coached Rudy Gobert about 10 times as much as Chris Finch has coached Rudy Gobert. Uh, he knows Gobert from the inside out. He built a franchise around Rudy Gobert. Nobody knows the pros and cons of Rudy Gobert better than Quinn Snyder. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. It's 6.30. Uh, I just want to close with a minute. Um, to just say that uh, uh, Harry sent you a thing, a support men post thing, and um, that the option is there for you. Whenever you want to do it is fine with me. Uh, unless the Wolves make the playoffs, this will probably be the last Zoom we do during this season. Uh, so I want to put in my word for the last time this season that uh, – Min post puts up with my idiosyncrasies. I write what I want to write pretty much when I want to write it. I want it to be turned around in a relatively quick fashion. And I want it promoted as best I can promote it. And uh, those are, you know, pretty egotistical demands. And I have been happy at Min post. I, uh, they have done that for me. I like the idea of being on a site that also has really good arts coverage and really good political coverage. Uh, two other things I'm very much interested in. It's not a sports centric uh, publication, but when I was uh, leaving the athletic and wondering what I was going to do, I had a lot of people chime in and say, well, you know, start a Pat Patreon 
and uh, you know we'll give you you know per month or whatever. And what I will say is, uh, if you still feel that way, you can regard Minpost as my Patreon, and in addition to getting me, you'll get a lot of really good stuff. Uh, they are the type of people that uh, give you the story, whether you pay or not, and I also really respect that. Uh, but they do need money, and like any other publication, um, what they can do relies on how much they have. And if they have more, they can do more. And if they have more, uh, maybe they can find ways to make me happier beyond money. So bottom line, if you have it in you and you want to give to Midpost, uh, that would be my preference and my blessing. Thanks for everybody for coming in. And uh, I guess uh, where the tip will be in about eight minutes, usually it's about 10 minutes after the announced time. Thanks. Thanks, Britt, so much for all that you do in covering the Timberwolves for Men Post and bringing this exciting Zoom to us uh, quarterly. And let's hope this isn't the last, meaning the Wolves do make the playoffs and we can continue this discussion well into the uh, spring. We appreciate you joining us. And again, if you can support, we appreciate that support and uh, monetary amount, but just following men post and the coverage that we bring is a, a form of support in itself. And we appreciate that. Uh, with that said, go Wolves. Thanks guys. Thanks Britt. Thank you. See you.